For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday morning, December the 29th, 1989. Midwinter Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is tape one of two tapes of the morning service. Well, the ministry has been just beyond what you, I could imagine. And I tell you, if you go back and re-listen to all those sermons and teachings and get out everything that's in there, you're going to really have learned something this week because there is things in there that you didn't hear when it was brought forth. There's things I've heard that I have got to re-listen to so I can get it in my spirit so I understand it so I rightly divide the word that was given. That's right. There's a lot of things that as we go along that are uh, contrary to our traditions and our heritage that we've got to get sorted out and put it under our feet. Get it out, get it out of our thinking and, and, and get ourselves cleansed of it so that it doesn't hinder our walk with the Lord. Amen. The Lord is moving on. He's not sitting still. He's changing me. And he's changing all the situation around about us. And it's doing is happening faster than we can even keep up with. But he said, in the, he said, in the end time, I will do a quick work. That wasn't only in the natural, but also in the spiritual. And I want him to do not only a quick work in the in the areas around us and in the uh, in the natural and the spiritual around us, but I want it in me as well. I want him to work in my heart. And uh, <clears throat> so this morning, Chuck Flynn's going to come and he's going to lay some more for us and uh, and we're going to sit, sit and listen as he teaches this morning. Brother Chuck. Thank you, Brother Glenn. Praise the Lord. The blood of sprinkling is our subject. Ten four, Jesus. Hallelujah. What's your twenty? He's here, isn't he? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. Enrich it to our hearts as we have set aside free this great week of conferences. And we thank you for those who have made an effort and are here and others, Lord, that will be here. And we praise you for your power and authority and those that are uh, on their way home, that there will be traveling protection. And we thank you for the traveler psalm, Psalms 121. Your watch are going out and are coming in. And we thank you for your word this morning. Open our ears to hear it, for you've given us the tongue of the learning and the open ear. In Jesus' name, amen. It's such a joy to always open the word of God to those that are hungry to know the Lord Jesus. And that's the great desire of the Holy Spirit that he may guide us into all truth. And that's in John 16, verse 13, one of the only places that the Urim and Thummim is mentioned in the New Testament in its identity. He will guide us into all truth. That's Thummim. In the Hebrew, the word thumen is the, the circle. Circle is a symbol. It is, there's no loose ends to Jesus. There's no dead end street. Everything you learn about him only enhances your knowledge of him. We're complete in him means we're encircled by him, the book of Colossians. The word peculiar also means around to be. We're a peculiar people because he has surrounded us with the Father's personality and the Father's creative word. It says that now some people, some religious people, were peculiar, falling in the power, dancing in the spirit, moving and shouting the glories of God, speaking in a heavenly language. But to God, in Psalm 33, it says the praise of the upright is comely. 
The word comely there is a very beautiful Hebrew word. The highest of royalty. It's the highest pleasure of the Father. Becoming. Suitable. In fact, if Emily Post was translating it, she would have put in there, the praise of the upright is etiquette. So when you're falling into power, dancing in the spirit, you're living in high society in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We don't take a back seat to nobody. The anointing of the Lord is upon us. And so this is why the, the completeness of the Lord, the thuban, the spirit of truth will guide us into all truth. The thumum of God is with us. And he will show us. He'll not speak of himself, paraphrasing, but he'll show us things to come. And that's where we get the word urum. Urum. U-W-R is the, the root of the word urum, which is fire, light, or illumination. And so the urum and thumum has illuminated you and I and the authority of the Old Testament Urim and Thummim has come by the Holy Ghost upon you and I today. Now the Urim and Thummim was placed behind the ephod on the high priest and the ephod representing all the people of the Lord. The twelve tribes, the precious stones, stood for each tribe that was put on the ephod. Behind the ephod, possibly in a leather pouch, it was had to be a position, an adjustable position of the Urim and Thummim. Now all the stones on the outside were representing the people were from the earth. But the stones representing the priestly tribes, God gave from heaven. The Levitical priesthood, the anointing of representing God to the earth and the earth to God. That's the Urim and Thummim, and those were placed, and that's how they put the different tribes in the Holy Land, the Urim and Thummim told them. How they nominated Saul, their first king. How David knew where to stand among the mulberry trees. Many things... When David inquired of the Lord, that's exactly what happened. The Yerman Thummim gave him direction. So the Yerman Thummim was placed behind the ephod in a leather pouch. It had to be positioned over the heart of the high priest. So at the Last Supper, it was of no accident that John the Beloved, fulfilling the Yerman Thummim anointing, put his head on the very chest of the high priest bringing from the Old Testament the anointing over to the disciples, not just that I know De Vinci and some of the boys in 13 to 1500, they would paint John as a little Lord Fortnoy type of sissified individual. John's the son of thunder. He's a man's man. And the reason why he put his head upon the chest of Jesus, not only representing the love of all the disciples for the Lord, but it represented the Urim and Thummim, the anointing, that we would hear the heart of the high priest. And when you read the word and study the word, the glory of God comes within you, and the Urim and Thummim begins to take place. You're led into all truth, and you will know things to come. That's our heritage. You don't have to be an expert or in some special category of gift. Every child of God has that position. The spirit of truth will guide us into all truth. Amen. That's why Jesus said to the Sadducees, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power, which is the Holy Ghost of God. This is why the authority, and as John put his ear to Jesus' chest, and the heartbeat of the Lord resounded within him. That's why you and I, when we know the Word, then the glory, the authority of the heartbeat, you have a natural bloodstream, you have a spiritual bloodstream. Most Christians are anemic. That's why the anointing of the bloodstream of the Lord flows within you. Hallelujah. 
And that's why the Apostle Paul, when he shook the viper in the fire, what, what, what was happening? The viper put poison into his system. But he already, in his spiritual and physical system of his blood capacity, had the blood flowing within him of the Son of God, of the heartbeat of Jesus, and that's the Word. And when he picked up the viper, he just shook it in the fire because the very Word was beating within him. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Ye shall speak with new tongues. Ye shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And here's the verse. You poison viper, here it is. No prayer. You don't have time to pray. The word's within you. And the word drives out the poison of every viper of life. And if you take up in the deadly thing, here it comes. And if you take up in the deadly thing, it shall not hurt you. Fling it back in the fire. We will not allow to be bitten. We will not allow the curse of poison. The words within us. It drives out every attack of the enemy. Cursing becomes a blessing. When he slung the viper in the fire, it affected the barbarous people. And Dr. Luke, the Holy Ghost said, Now, Luke, I'm going to use your personality. I'm going to use your background. And Dr. Luke wrote in Psalms 28, verse, uh, pardon me, Acts 28, verse 6, Dr. Luke wrote that when they saw the barbarous people, saw Paul shake the viper back in the fire, then he brought that died, he gave you a medical example of what would happen in a normal case when poison would hit an individual. Diagnosed it. He said he didn't swell up and he didn't fall down immediately. Now there is a medical diagnosis of this type of poison. You swell up in the Darien province below Panama. We were there with the missionaries. They said one young man was bitten by this type of viper. He swelled up. They had to put him in the ground. They had to build three caskets before they could get him in the ground. And that's why Luke diagnosed it. And he says when they saw he didn't swell up or fall down dead suddenly, they changed their mind. And Dr. Luke, the Holy Ghost, allowed him for the word change to put in a beautiful Greek word, metabalo, M-E-T-A-B-A-L-L-O, metabalo, which is where we get the English word for the anatomy, metabolism. And this is what's going to happen in the 90s. The anointing of God will come upon the children of the Lord. The bloodstream of the heart of Jesus will flow through us because of his word. And we're going to see others around us see we will shake the vipers in the fire and they'll have a metabolism of the mind. We know there's a metabolism in the natural anatomy, the glands of your body and the balance of sugars and salts and it affects other parts of the body if your balance is abnormal. But also we have a metabolism of the mind. And therefore, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Men are sick today. Mentally. Their thinking is sick. And therefore, the authority of God and the anointing of His Word will release the Holy Ghost anointing. And the blood speaks. And when the blood speaks to you and I, and we cast the vipers of life into the fire, men shall see the glory of God and they will have a metabolism of their mind and begin to think right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's the strength we have. Let's turn to Hebrews 12. We're dealing with this. That was the, just the introduction of the blood of sprinkling. The power of this precious blood and the very heartbeat of Jesus. As you put your ear to his heart and to his chest, 
hearing the glory of the Lord. In Hebrews 12, this tremendous 24th verse, we haven't come to blackness and darkness and tempest, verse 18, but in verse 24, and to Jesus, we've come to Mount Zion, that's David's tabernacle, there are five levels to Jerusalem. Don't be surprised if you wonder, well, how can people, boy, the Holy Ghost wouldn't allow me to, to do certain things. It's because people have not attained Mount Zion's experience. There's five levels to Jerusalem. Acre, Bazitha, Moriah, Ophel, where eyes are open, where the blind man washed. And we see Jesus in Mount Zion. But the key of David and the tabernacle of David is restored, as Acts 15 tells us, through the half-brother James that was in charge. So now we see this tremendous Hebrews 12, this that we have come unto Mount Zion and the city of the living God, which is the bride, the heavenly Jerusalem, numerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, each of them is what you and I have come unto. You should know something about that. Which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. I want you to go through this in Hebrews 12, verse 22. Circle unto, but ye are come unto. Then circle to an innumerable company of angels. To the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to, circle it, the blood of sprinkling. Just as important as Jesus, the mediator, is the blood of sprinkling. That's what the Holy Ghost is trying to tell us here. We come unto the church. We come unto angels. We come unto God the judge. We've come unto all the beautiful facets and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And also we've come to the blood, to the blood of sprinkling. To speak of better things than that of Abel. See that she refused not him, verse 25 says, that for if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. If we come to the blood, then we better know exactly the authority and the word that it gives us, that power, that knowledge of the precious blood of Jesus. So I was thinking of this, of the blood, this theme of, of glory and the authority of the precious blood that we are redeemed. And just how the blood affects you and I and the different facets of, of beauty and victory that the blood has purchased for us. And I was thinking about the resurrection and the Spirit of God just touched my heart that Jesus was resurrected in three dimensions. Put it in your notes, please. He's resurrected in his body, his blood, and his breath. He was resurrected in his body. He's resurrected in his blood. He was resurrected in his breath. Because when he returned from the Father, he breathed on his disciples, not an ordinary breath. It was the infuseo, the eternal breath, the same, the infuseo, the only place in the New Testament it is recorded. It's only recorded twice in the Old Testament, but it means the same. One is in the Hebrew, one is in the Greek. In the Hebrew, the word is nephok. When God breathed into Adam, the nephok, the breath of life, and Adam become a living soul. Jesus took the same breath and breathed on his disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. It's a new civilization. It's a new conquering humanity. Jesus breathed upon us when we received the breath of the Spirit. Hallelujah. The only other place it's found is Ezekiel 37. 
In that tremendous portion where God told Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind. And the word wind is the word naphok, which is the same breath Jesus breathed on his disciples after his resurrection. Prophesy means when you speak, you're speaking the creative breath of the Spirit upon people and lifting death off of them. They begin to live by the word of the Lord that's within them. Prophecy is of a very great, higher, higher calling than we have even fathomed. It's the creative word. It's not a shinola gift. You understand this? Yeah. Something to show off about? Creative anointing. It's a, a tremendous, precious, desirable, protective. It's been put down. It's been humiliated. It hasn't been given the rightful place. Our services are not the alarm that the Apostle Paul, under the anointing of the Spirit, wanted our services to have. He says, when you hear the trumpet, you'll know through the gifts of the Spirit, those are the trumpet anointing that will bring an alarm. And every child of God will hear the alarm and know what to do. I'll go into that in my next session. The alarm of the trumpets. The different trumpet anointings that are on the church. So now we're dealing with how was the blood resurrected? I never even looked into it. I didn't even know I could have that privilege. The Spirit of God said there was a pause in the resurrection. Now let's look at Matthew Let's investigate now, so keep, stay with me. Matthew 27, chapter. Matthew 27, verse 52 and 53. Please put it in your notes, the pause in the resurrection. And the graves were opened, verse 52 of Matthew 27 says, The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. This is possibly why Joseph told them when they left Egypt, he said, when you leave, take my bones with you. Because he knew there was a greater resurrection and he wanted to be up there with Abraham, Isaac, <laughs> and his daddy. When you leave here, when you leave Egypt, take my bones with you. That's the authority we have. In fact, Joseph, through the revelation, let's pause there, go back to uh, Psalms 81, please know that this prophetic authority was upon Joseph. Psalms 81 tells us, Sing aloud unto God our strength, and make a joyful noise unto the Lord, or the God of Jacob. Take a psalm, bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the psaltery. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in the time appointed on our solemn feast days. For this was a statute for Israel, and a law of the God of Jacob, Verse 5 is the important verse. This is ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt where I heard a language that I understood not. This is what Joseph said. Now the Bible is not going to take time and effort just to record that Joseph, who was a great traveler, and knew many languages, that he heard a language that was another language of the earth. No, he heard the groanings, the Holy Ghost language on the people of Israel 400 years before it happened. There was tongues in Egypt. Please underline that, please, because you'll get debates on that one. I heard more than 400. I heard a language 
that I understood not. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were delivered from the pots. Now this eye in verse 6 is not the eye of of Joseph, I heard a language. This eye is the Messiah, Jesus. And Jesus now is interpreting and bringing to Joseph the revelation that I removed his shoulder from the burden. In other words, Israel will be under great stress and slavery. And Joseph knew it by this verse 6. Jesus gave him, let's say, the interpretation of the anointing he was receiving. And Jesus is saying, I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were delivered from the pots. For thou callest in trouble, and I delivered thee. And I answered thee, and then went on to say that the complete, the secret place of thunder, I proved thee at the waters of Meribah, Selah, and on into the different provings. But he begins with, the tremendous taking of the straw from the mortar to make the bricks. For I delivered his hands from the pots. The word pots there is the Hebrew word dud, D-U-D, and it is the word that means baskets for making bricks. So Joseph knew from Psalms 81 that there was to be Israel in bondage and the making of bricks would be sort of a straw that he's telling him that there is, he heard this language that I understood not. And it's interesting that Stephen would bring something like this out. Let's look at uh, Acts 7. And Stephen said this, I have seen in verse 34, Acts 7:34. As God is dealing with Abraham, uh, pardon me, Moses, verse 32 saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Verse 33, then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. There's two ways God purifies the ground. Both of them are through the saints of God. One is by fire, and the other is with the sword. And so you and I have the sword of his mouth, which is the authority of the word within us, with the Holy Ghost, and we can speak to the land and purify the land. Why do you think he had his sword drawn? When... Joshua came over to him, the captain of the host of the Lord. He had already battled and purified the land. Here is the burning bush. The ground is holy. You get that? We have authority over the earth. And by that, we have that, that knowledge and that power to purify. And every battle is preceded, preceded. Before your battles, you purify your land. Hmm? Every battle you and I have must be in conjunction with, and, and we start moaning and groaning over our problem instead of purifying the earth. You speak to your earth that your house is on and where you work. You speak, you purify your land and your problems. Problems are not solved, they're dissolved. Let's use the great weapons and authority God has given us. And so Stephen continues, I have seen, I have seen, in verse 34, the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning. Please circle that. And I'm come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. And it just so happened, this is the only other place that the word groaning pertaining to the Holy Ghost gifts of speaking in a heavenly language is used except Romans 8, 26. We don't know how to pray as we are, but with groanings, and that word is stenagmus in the Greek. It's also found here, the word is stenagmus, groanings. 
the unutterable gushings of the heart. A man that was a Greek from Athens, Greek, Greece, said to Brother Chuck, he said, can I say something? And I was teaching this to a couple's conference. And I said, well, yes, what is it? He said, in Athens, it's the nagamos. And he says, it means if the heart of God could speak, this is the way it would sound. The unutterable gushings of the heart. When you pray in tongues, you're praying in the will of God. Don't let anybody ridicule what's the purpose of tongues. Just say, but at least I'm praying in God's will. The Word says that. Amen. Let's quit trying to get around the bush and let's, let's tell people what the Word says. Amen. Well, now that's the authority. So the saints came out of the graves after his resurrection, went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So we have a pause in the resurrection. Why? We've got the saints going into Jerusalem. It's probably 40 minutes to an hour and a half. Now let's turn over to John 20 and see what Jesus is doing during the pause in the resurrection. But Mary stood in verse 11. Mary Magdalene. She stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. See the two angels in white sitting, the one at his head, and the uh, at the head, and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. I'm in John 20th chapter and verse 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, which he is. Amen. He's the eternal gardener. And put down Luke 13 there when he says, Now, Father, give me a year. He said, The husbandman. And when the Lord came, he said, Father, give me a year. That's what he means. And let me dig around the trees so that it'll bring forth fruit. Let me not only dig around it, but I'll dung it and I'll water it. That's something that we've lost within the character of Christ in the body of Christ, the husbandman anointing. How many loved ones do you have that you say, Father, give me a year with them and I will tenderly forgive and I will dung them with love and joy and peace and long suffering. I will especially work at their salvation so that they can produce fruit. How many in our finances, on your job and, and in your business, whatever it is, give me a year. It doesn't mean you're timing God. It just means that you're going to make special effort to dig around them to dung it, to water it with the Word, to shoot the power of God and attention so that that tree may bear fruit. That's the husbandman anointing. We pray a little bit, but we, we don't give forth that fruit of the Spirit and, and the fertilizer, if you please, the graciousness. And we allow hurts and unforgiving events to fester till we have the heart of bitterness. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Let us, let us come on into the husbandman anointing. Hallelujah. Jesus is the gardener. And he said around you and I, just give me a little time with him, Father. Thank God he did it. He went to the cross. He watered us. He dug around us. He broke up the fallow ground. Thank God for the fruit now. Bring it on, Father. Bring it on. Hallelujah. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus saith unto her, Cleave to me not. Touch me not doesn't mean just touch me not. It, she was holding on to him. So the Greek word there for touch is apto, A-P-T-O, which means to hold firmly, cleave to. She said, don't cleave to me. 
for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I send unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Here is the evidence that there was a pause in the resurrection. The Old Testament saints are out of the graves. They're visiting with many in Jerusalem. Now, why is there a pause in the resurrection? Jesus said, I have not yet ascended to my Father. What are you waiting on? The blood must be retrieved. The blood must be retrieved. Without the shedding of blood, the Word says, there's no benefit or remission for sin. So the retrieving of the blood. Have you seen these commercials on TV, especially a little uh, rambunctious little boy has uh, either ketchup or mustard all over him, and then it just seems like it just, when you use a certain detergent, it just, just pulls it. I, I sort of can visualize the blood just, just coming forth and being joined together till its voice is developed. But see, the high priest that led captivity captive can't leave the earth without the blood. See that? The high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies with the blood before him. There's no other way you can get in. Hallelujah! And so as the blood, Jesus could not just ascend. He's got to wait for the blood. And so the blood has to be retrieved. And let's backtrack. The blood that stained, and hey, there was no blood that stained the shroud of Jesus. There's no blood left on, uh, there's no blood of Jesus left on the earth. The blood is under the mercy seat in heaven today. Amen. So the blood is retrieved from the grave clothes. And what is the benefit then? Without the shedding of blood, no remission, no benefit. For when the blood is retrieved from the grave, it takes away the sting of death off of us. Hallelujah. That's the benefit. There's no sting of death to the believer that has the blood in him. Or her. We backtrack. We go on up to the cross and the blood has streamed down his body, down to the earth. At noon, the great earthquake happens. The blood goes into the earth. What is happening? The blood has to be retrieved from the earth. Why? Because all creation, in Romans 8 and verse 23, all creation groans for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, who told the earth that? The blood did. The blood of Jesus going down into the earth. The purifying the anointing of that precious blood that spoke that you will cooperate the earth will cooperate with all those that speak from the standpoint of the blood that's within us and you and I have power over the ground and over the earth because the blood of Jesus is within us and at Calvary the earth heard the voice of the blood and said, one day there will be those that will be the manifesting sons of God, and you'll respond to them. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And just because there's this group or that group that go overemphasizes some little portion of Scripture, there's no sign it's not true. We will hold fast to the authority that the manifesting glory of God and the blood spoke to the earth, and the earth has responded to the word. For the earth is all creation grown up for the manifesting of God. Why? What manifests? The power of the blood in us to take authority over the earth so that people can live at peace and rebuke the power of the devil. Glory to God. The blood is retrieved from the earth and joins the blood that has set the grave free. Now the blood is retrieved from the feet. The spikes that were put in his feet, what is the benefit? The blood, when that spike was taken out, 
the blood that hung on to that spike is put to the side. The blood has to be retrieved from every area. Now, what was the benefit of the nails, the nail that was in his feet? The blood retrieved, guidance. Guidance has been given to us. Because of Psalms 119 and verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And because they put the spike in his feet, the glory of God leads me in the word. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The blood's retrieved from the spike in his left hand. That was put not only in the palm, but in the place of the wrist. Where many turned to commit suicide. That's why the spike that was in his left wrist says that life's worth living when you know Jesus. The blood that's retrieved, hallelujah, sets people free from suicidal tendencies. Amen. It's the left wrist that he's go to, usually. Because the anointing and the power of the precious blood, it gives men purpose to live. Hallelujah. Oh, And on the nail from the right wrist, as it was pulled out and thrown to the side, the blood has to be retrieved from the right. It goes back to Psalms 1, verse 3. Whatever your hand finds to do, it will prosper. Hallelujah. Because the anointing, you'll always be provided for. You may say, well, I have a limited income. I don't care. You don't. Jesus is not limiting your income. You let the anointing of the precious blood. This is the right hand provision of God. And it means whatever your hand finds to do will prosper. You always. That's why Peter didn't say, well, silver and gold have I none. It's, well, he, he meant the anointing that's within me. When I release that anointing, that silver and gold under me, why would Peter say, uh, Lord, I'll, I'll build the three tabernacles? The anointing, the purpose of God is that when you minister to others, your needs are met. Whenever you have a need, if you'll just begin to give out and give forth of yourself and let the anointing move through you to help somebody, you'll find your needs are just met, right? Just automatically. Hallelujah. It's because the precious blood has been retrieved from that spike in his right wrist, that means that whatever your hand finds to do, you'll prosper in it. it does not only mean secular work, but it means spiritual ministry. Everything you do will be a prosper, prosperous anointing and victory in your life. The blood was retrieved from the crown of thorns that was put upon his head. Why did the Father allow that? See, nothing happened to Jesus but what the Father permitted it. And when they put those crown of thorns, it was not just some stickers like we have around here. Those thorns were two and three inches long. And when they plated that crown of thorns, and put it down and crushed it down upon his forehead. Every mother knows any wound on the head bleeds more than any other part of the body. And so, therefore, I never heard that the crown of thorns was in the atonement. But it is. Why is the crown of thorns in the atonement? Because those thorns pierced and cut into his mind and his spirit. Therefore, you and I have peace of mind. And he told Ezekiel, he said, Ezekiel 44, he says, I want you to tell my priests to wear linen. I don't want them to be, to be uh, perspiring in the ministry. When you're a child of God, in most cases, when, when you see a person or ministry that always is, is giving for now, I, I've got to go off the air tomorrow because I, I'm, I'm exhausted. The funds are, and it's no, and you know, this and and, when, and because of the bakers, I'm, I'm, I don't have funds. See, the anointing of the call of God says, and that's what the Lord spoke to my heart in my earlier ministry. I come from a board meeting of our church, and they used the board on me, I felt, and, and I was just so discouraged. I said, Lord, when are you going to give me something I can enjoy in your ministry? 
I sat down in my front room and I just leaned against the wall, putting my knees up and, and just sort of sitting there, exhausted of the duties of the ministry and the lack of appreciation of anything. But see, that's good training. But Jesus came, he'll always be sensitive to your position and predicament. He came and he sat down in the same fashion. He just leaned up again, didn't look at me, just looked forward. I knew I was in for it then. <laughs> Finally, he spoke to me and said, Son, why do you think they put the crown of thorns on my head? I said, with my spirit. I was just talking to him through my spirit. I said, well, because you said you were Lord and and they ridiculed you. You said you were God. He said that might be so. Or king, I think is the word I use. But he said the Father did not allow or permit anything that was not for the benefit of my people. And he said, Remember, son, he said, when Adam fell, he tilled the ground. As he tilled the ground, the thorn and the thistle, by the sweat of his brow. The ground, the brow, the thorn, the sweat. He said, That's why the Father allowed them to use thorns, putting it upon my head. It put the curse that's on the earth in reverse. And now I'm king over the curse. Praise God, he said. Now, son, I've released you. And the curse of toiling is lifted off of you. And from now on, you'll minister with great grace and not be under the toiling of the call that I've given you. Hallelujah. You'll not be under the toil of it. You'll not be going out of business tomorrow. You won't depend upon an amount. I'll always provide the anointing of my presence will be with you. You'll always be certain opposition of the carnalities of men. You listen to my voice. I've lifted off of you the curse of toil by the atonement of the crown of thorns and the mental anguish is lifted from my people. Let's praise him. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah put it like this. Isaiah said that God will lift off of us the spirit of heaviness and give us the garments of praise. Spirit of heaviness means failing spirit, negative language that comes forth. Do you ever talk to people that they can always find something wrong? Oh, you got a pimple there, you know, Uncle Stone. Well, you know. Uncle so-and-so had a pimple like that. Boy, in three days, he's gone. <laughs> Always, the spirit of heaviness is a negative report. Go all the way back to the ten spies. That's your spirit of heaviness. And the next thing they'll be doing is stoning you. God says praise breaks that. That's right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. That's why you're here in these services. You've been set free. Hallelujah. The spirit of heaviness. So the blood's retrieved from the crown of thorns and any blood that was upon those thorns that pierced his head and blood just streamed down his beard and onto his body and onto his, the cross and into the ground. Though so that blood has been retrieved. Hallelujah. And then when they whipped him at Pilate's, they put on him Herod's robe. So that robe was really matted with the blood from his back, with whose stripes were healed. And that robe was cast over on the side, and because it had no seam, they gambled over it. And so when the blood is retrieved from that robe, it rebuked all habits of the world, all gambling, all narcotics, all types of tobacco and alcohol habits, all things that would try to rule man's mind and spirit, the blood is retrieved so you and I can be set free. 
and we have a robe of righteousness, the holiness of God. The blood was retrieved from the spear that pierced his side after he had given up the ghost. Why? Because out from his heart flowed the blood and the water. And the atonement of blood and water is that this is the anointing of the salvation which is in the blood and the water of the word. So here you have in men's, men and male and female together, you have the womb and the heart. And some, as we are born again, we're born again by the water of the word that's around the womb. And when the water breaks, when the word is preached, there's a birthing. Hallelujah. But most people and most Christians will stay around the womb. And that's what stymied the children of God in our day and has brought a great limitation to our services. We're rehashing womb services and sermons. Our commission was not just to see people saved the Holy Ghost will draw them to the Father. Our commission is to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. The saints are setting on their good intentions, splitting hairs, splitting churches, crucifying ministers, preachers' wives with breakdowns, and all kinds of lasciviousness can come in because our message is not according to what he has ordained it to be. Yes, there's water in the word. And when the word is preached, and it should be so, these we ought not who to have done, but we should not have left the other undone. Don't forget there's a heart. And at the heart, blood and water comes forth. The word, and that's why Saul was a man just around the womb. Honor me before the elders. But Samuel told Saul, God has chosen him a man that's after his own womb, elbow, heart. Now let's believe that ministers and the power and the anointing of God would be released. That when we're born again and the womb anointing is among us and many are saved. But yet that does not stymie us. That does not limit us. We're going to go on in and pursue the word that leads us to his heart. There's some vital word here that lets us know his heart. Amen. Thank God for the birthing. Most evangelicals are still around the womb. Let's get, let's get souls saved. Hey, it sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds religious. No, we're not to leave it undone, but we have neglected to go on in to the heart, the key of David, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Therefore, the authority of the blood leads us. And that's why out from his heart flowed the water and the blood the blood was retrieved. Hallelujah. The blood's retrieved all of every step he took to give. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. Of the Friday morning service of December the 29th, 1989. Of the Midwinter Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. And took his identity from him. He fulfilled his own scripture. If you lose your life, you'll save it. And if you save your life, you'll lose it. But when they came and they hit him in the face, and Dr. Weiss said it was not just with the palms. The Greek there is very strong. They caught him with the fist. As he was bound, they hit him real hard. As he would go over, they would catch him and bring him back. And then they would catch him again until every muscle, every kind of, of uh, uh, corpuscle in his face, he was brutally marred more than any other man. What happened? They beat the identity from him. And what were they saying when they were beating him? Prophesy to us. Who is it that hits you? Two gifts are involved there. The gifts 
of prophecy and the word of knowledge. And those two gifts, if it had just been one gift, then we probably could have been argued, well, that was just all that was. No, those gifts represent all the other gifts. In other words, the gifts of the Spirit are in the atonement. By the beating of his face, he lost his life. Now, how does he find his life? When you and I release the gifts of the Holy Ghost, speaking in a heavenly language, prophesying, thus saith the Lord, moving in the gifts and the power and the anointing of healing and faith and wisdom, the miracles of God and the discernments and the words of knowledge, glory to God, when the gifts and fruits of the Spirit, because why? He finds himself in the way you react to the anointing of the Spirit. Hallelujah. And you say, thus saith the Lord, and you move out in the gifts and the power of the Holy Ghost. That's when Jesus finds himself. If you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. And he lost his life for our sake. Therefore, he finds it within us as we release the fruits and gifts of the Spirit. Then it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. So now the blood is complete. Every area, every drop of blood has been retrieved. Now, the saints are coming from the old city of Jerusalem. And Jesus hears the voice of the blood coming down the street. The conquering ability that all men now can be saved because of the great authority and the sacrifice of the cross and the blood that forgives and forgets. The blood begins to preach the unsearchable riches. It speaks better things. And as the blood preached down the street, the high priest stood. And as the blood found its place in front of him, the blood was lifted first. And as the blood was lifted, then Jesus followed it. Because the blood had to go first into the throne of God. And the blood on its way preached to the earth. Then it preached to the sun and the moon and all the planets of our little universe. Then it began to preach through our Milky Way, and the blood preached through every galaxy. All the universe heard that the blood has been shed, and men can be saved as they repent. The gospel has truly been preached to all of God's creation. And when the blood found its way and led captivity captive, a great stream of souls, they was taken up by the power and the anointing of the precious blood of Jesus. And the blood preached, hallelujah, all the way to heaven, through the pearly gates, down the streets of gold. The blood preached salvation, purity and glory, and forgiveness and love. The Father recognized the blood. The Father recognized the power and the authority of the blood. And the sacrifice was done. Glory to God. Strength of the blood. And then Jesus. The next action was Jesus took his blood, according to Hebrews 9, and he purified the heavenly tabernacle. He purified the altar of incense. He purified the, the golden lampstands. He purified all heavenly things. Hallelujah. Because of the blood that purified. And as the blood preached, the glory, the authority, all spoke better things than that of Babel. And the blood was put under the mercy seat. And the next thing that happens to the blood is that Jesus will bring his belt, what the Bible calls the vesture. And he takes the vesture and dips it. Now, vesture is woven. It's very thick. It's about six inches long. And on it is written, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Is that it? Is that it? There's a writing on the vesture. That's his belt. And as he takes that vesture and dips it into the blood, all the blood is, comes into the belt of champion. And that's why you and I have the belt of the blood around us already, around our midsection. And don't, and have you wondered why the Boxing Commission has the belt of champion and why the wrestlers? Seems like every wrestler has a, a, a belt. Where did they get that? They got it from the Bible. They got it from the one who is the champion of champions, who will come and rule on the earth because 
the blood of the everlasting covenant, the eternal covenant, has soaked into the vesture. Now you and I have the belt of the blood around us, and we're more than conquerors and overcomers through him that loved us. Because the, the blood, and every time you speak in tongues, the blood speaks through you. And the championship of the belt is around about you. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You can speak to the earth. You can speak to all demon power. You can speak to all evil princes of the nations. And in the name of Jesus, because the belt of the blood is around us, already spiritually, that, see, he has given us that privilege to walk in his power, his authority, and the goodness and glory of our God. Hallelujah! That's the strength we have. Now Hebrews 12 goes on, and it says, the bell of the, We have come to the blood, and it doesn't leave us there, but I want you to underline and circle of sprinkling. And I wondered why, what in the world? To the blood of sprinkling. And for many days I, I looked at that, and how does that relate to the body of Christ? Of course, it speaks better things than that label. But what is this blood of sprinkling? And so as I investigated the word, I had to go to Hebrews 9. So Hebrews 9th chapter, please. 11. The Christ being come in height of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Hallelujah. He entered in once into the holy place. Once was enough. The holy place is in heaven, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13 is the verse I wanted you to look at. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes, now here's something new, the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is our communion service. It goes on down and says how Moses, he dedicated the first testament. And so Jesus brings forth, and in verse 20 says, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moses did that. And Jesus said, this is the blood of the new test. Our communion services has lost the power and the original intent that Jesus our Lord wanted to perfect. What is it? It's in verse 14. Who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God. Now, here it is. Our communion services should be Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Communion services has come down to just taking a wafer and everybody crack it at once in some areas. It's more than that. It's more than just a remission with the mentality. It means a spiritual consuming by the Holy Spirit that your conscience, that man has tried and religious spirits have, that you have a conscience and your conscience will be purged by the glory of the communion service so that you'll see dead works and you'll serve the living God. Put the dead works behind us. And that's why our communion services are to take on fresh. Do it, Father. Amen. Do it, Jesus. Give us a fresh approach and anointing by thy word. Purge our conscience from dead works so that we can discern the body of Christ the ministry of others and appreciate the anointing that's upon us. Hallelujah. So let's go back to verse 13. This is the word spring we're dealing with now. For it's the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer. Ashes of an heifer? 
So now we have a clue. We've got to know what the ashes of an heifer means. Sprinkling. If he's the blood of sprinkling, we better know now what the ashes of an heifer mean. Sprinkling. The Jerusalem Post has re reported recently that they in Israel are now breeding the ancient bread of the red heifer. They're setting the stage. They're looking for not only the Ark of the Covenant, but the ashes of the red heifer. They can't sacrifice till they have the ashes. But to you and I, it means far greater. The ashes of an heifer sprinkling. But now why has the writer of the book of Hebrews on the anointing of the Spirit brought it out? We've got to know about it. I always felt that, and I was told in, in my training of Bible college, that, well, these are rituals of Israel in, in the wilderness journeys, and, and they have to do with Israel, but now we're set free in these epistles and so on and so forth. And I, I find out that's not the way. I find out I've got to know. So the Holy Ghost takes me back, and let's go with him to Numbers 19. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers, the 19th chapter, we see here the quality, the authority of the sprinkling. Now we're dealing with here one of the great statutes of God. In verse 10 it says, for a statute forever. Do you underline that please? Numbers 19 verse 10. So we know that we have to have the knowledge of these statutes that are forever. I don't want any whining and questions that, well, I don't know, I don't understand it. You better understand it. The Holy Ghost will reveal it to you. That's why we're here. It's forever. Maybe not in the same mechanics, but it has spiritual truth that are, is forever to the church. Let's begin with verse 1 in Numbers 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law, <coughs> which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. A uh, heifer that's never been tied up. You shall give her unto Eliezer. Wait a minute. Give her? Hey. I had to stop right there. And I said, hey, you, did you know, Father, that some of your ministers that never recognize the feminine gender? Why should you choose the ashes of a heifer or her to represent the precious blood? So I had to deal with that. So let's hold that. Leviticus 27, this is the price of redemption when you come into the land, God is saying. And the priest shall give an estimation. And thy estimation, verse 3, shall be of the male from 20 years old, even unto 60 years old. Even thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of an, the sanctuary. And please underline verse 4. And if it be a female, then thy estimation shall be 30 shekels or pieces of silver. This is the price of redemption. Now anything that's taught in the Moses books, Genesis to Deuteronomy and of course through the King, has to be filtered through the prophets if it ever is released in spiritual tone in the New Testament. Did you hear that? Everything that you and I, that is a statute forever, for us to walk in it. That's why it's very vital. You can't just investigate Numbers 19. Now you've got to go to the prophets. So the full covenants of God are to be exposed in the life of every believer. Hallelujah. We cannot live our Christian life on the epistles alone. We've got to have Moses. That's why Jesus, when he walked with the two on the road to Emmaus, he explained to them Moses and the Psalms and the prophets. Amen? Because he's there. <laughs> he's there. So now let's go to Zechariah 11 and verse 12. We've got to see what the prophets have said about this female Christ 
of redemption from 20 years of age, what was it, to 60? 20 years to 60. So Zechariah, Malachi, Zechariah 11, chapter 11. It's a beautiful portion of Scripture, but we're pressed for time. Let's go to verse 12. And I said unto them, Messiah's talking, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price, fifty, the price of the male, thirty. You see that? Underline it. Don't you let any chauvinist minister <laughs> rob us of one of the greatest truths of God's Word. It's not according to male and female bond or free or Jew or Greek. It's the anointing upon the individual. The glory of God. Hallelujah. And so, so they weighed for my price 30 pieces of... And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter. You think Ju Judas betrayed Jesus? No. The Father's will was done in all this. It wasn't up to Judas. Sure. But the heart yielded to and so Satan came in through the covetousness. But what is here is, I want to bring out the consistency that God had in his word. In other words, he prophesied it, but he knew exactly. And why he planned it this way is beautiful. And the Lord said unto me, cast... Now, I didn't mean to say, I must clarify, you know Judas was a free moral agent. God just has his all knowledge. That's why the Word will predict, and yet it will be fulfilled. And so the Lord is prophesying here, and the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter. Isn't that what happened to the 30 pieces of silver? They bought the potter's field for the poor to be buried in. The potter's field, why is it called a potter's field? Because there's where the broken vessels were thrown, discarded. A goodly price that I was prized at of them, and I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So the prophet now is prophesying from one individual standpoint to the next, and he's giving forth a tremendous action in the betrayal of our Lord Jesus Christ. Shall I say this? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to present to you that Jesus was not betrayed but his. And that's why the 30 pieces of silver, you're ahead of me, it's the female price of redemption. Jesus stood up for you and I. He took our place. Of course, we say he was betrayed, but... He stood for you and I, and that's why they prized him. I don't know what was the thinking of the priest, but they fulfilled the word. They prized him with the theme. They knew what they were doing. It was a ridicule against him. And so, whatever their occasion, they knew to fulfill Scripture. They put upon him the price of the female, which is the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the church. Hallelujah. That's why 30 pieces of silver was used. Not the price of the male, but he stood up for you and I. He was betrayed, yes, but really what Satan was trying to do is destroy mankind. But Jesus stood in your place and mine. He says, I'm going to stand here, and you're going to prize me the female price of the bride. And it's the bride that's really being crucified. <laughs> so we can be set free. Power of the blood of sprinkling. Back to Numbers 19. Hallelujah. Thank God for the word. So Eliezer, the, pri the priest, may bring her without the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. I'm at verse 3. And Eliezer, the priest, shall take of her blood with his finger and sprinkle... There's the first word, sprinkle, please underline it. Sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. This is the office of the blood of Jesus that you not only receive 
the blood for salvation, but the seven dimensions of the blood, which we will call in the Revelation the seven spirits of God. That's why Eliezer took the blood with his finger and put it upon the tabernacle, which is the body of Christ, four, five, six, seven times. And in Isaiah 11, verse 2, it speaks of the seven spirits of God. They're implied. It doesn't say these are the seven spirits. If it says that in Revelation. But if you want to know what abilities you have, let's turn to Isaiah and just quickly read it, and then we'll come back. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah 11, 11 chapter. I'll read verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now these are the seven spirits of God. And the spirit, small s, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, one. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. You get seven there? Let's do it again. The Spirit. Now let me explain this. Put down the word ruach. That's the Hebrew word for spirit. R-U-A-C-H. And that's the same word for Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. So the word cool or companionship with the divine deity. And that's the first thing God gives you and I through the blood is companionship with God. We walk with God in the cool of the day. The Ruach doesn't mean 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It means you're walking with God 24 hours a day all the time. And you're walking with him in the fellowship and the power of the seven spirits of God. Number one is this Ruach, the spirit or fellowship of the Lord shall rest upon him. In other words, God's presence through the blood comes upon us. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. We receive it, Father. Second and third, the spirit of counsel and might. Fourth and fifth, the spirit of knowledge. Sixth, and of the fear of the Lord. Seven. Seven spirits of God. And in your commentaries, you'll find that that relates to Revelation, of course. Now, the third verse says, and Dick Mills taught me this one. It was very beautiful. And shall make him of quick understanding. And that means in the Hebrew, quick means catch the scent of a hound. You'll have a spiritual scent. Like in the natural, the hound has a tremendous scent to pick up and to confine and trace, so it is in the Spirit. You have been released that you'll not just judge or you'll not just act or react by the seeing of the eye or the hearing of the ear, but you will have quick understanding. It will be given by the Holy Ghost a spiritual sense that will be so keen that when our children need to be disciplined or in the church or in in the secular life and our business we will have quick understanding you're going to know all the ramifications buying and selling of homes or land or buildings you'll have all the ramifications you'll not be hoodwinked say it with me i have quick understanding because of the blood the seven spirits of god by the Holy Ghost is on me. Amen. Hallelujah. Back to Numbers 19. All right, the sprinkling, the seven spirits of God on the tabernacle. And then, verse 6, And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes why, well, I want you to underline verse 6. Why cedar wood means preservation, will not rot. The cedar wood. Hyssop is faith. Hyssop means an applicator, a sponge. You apply, you operate faith. Hallelujah. Scarlet, of course, redemption. So cedar wood, hyssop, faith, preservation. And redemption is in the ashes of the heifer. Verse 9, And a man that is clean shall gather up, underline it, gather up the ashes of the heifer, 
and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel. Now we add something to the ashes, a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. It's a statute forever in verse 10. So now running water is applied. Let's skip on down. Water separation also is in verse 13, the tabernacle of the Lord. In verse 17, I must go on for an unclean person. And for an unclean person, they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for sin, and running water shall be put thereto in a vessel, underlying running water. <coughs> and a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water. So you take a sponge, you dip it in the water, and you sprinkle it with great force. That's the Hebrew word there. First with great force, upon the tent, underlined tent, and upon all the vessels, and upon the persons that were there. And where? Where someone has died. And upon him that touched the bone, or one slain, or one dead, or a grave, the clean person shall sprinkle. And then, of course, there's days involved, but this is the primary teaching connecting with the ashes of the red heifer and the blood of sprinkling is that God did not want any death on Israel. Every day before sundown, if anybody passed away, a clean person, doesn't have to be a priest, anybody that knows the, the tremendous authority of the water of separation, that God does not want any death to be connected with us He's given us the blood. We're separated from death. So they would bring a sponge, dip it in where the ashes were in the running water, and as they dipped it in, they would come to the tent and they would sprinkle the water of separation upon the tent. They would go in to all the furniture and the people that were there and the loved ones, and they would sprinkle them with that water. The heathens picked it up and called it holy water. There's nothing to it to the blood of sprinkling. The water of the ashes of the red heifer, what is happening is all death and all the furniture and the tent. There's no death in Israel. It's lifted off of them. Because of the ashes of the red heifer and the water of separation, the sprinkling process has to be done. Glory to God. And that's why the anointing of the blood within us and when we speak the word of God and when we prophesy speak God's glory and speak the anointing of His Word, we prophesy we're lifting death off of people. I have prophesied over people. They've been set free. Uh, brother and sister Ida Hosa had no children for seven years. And the first time we went to Nigeria, she was the last one in line of some 4,000 that I ministered to. And I called Benson down and prayed, and the prophetic word come upon them, and God in front of everybody, he spoke it. I will give you issue. By the prophetic word, they were sprinkled with life. Death lifted off of them, and 11 months later, they had a little boy. 11 months later, a girl. 10 months, a girl. 11 months, another girl. And Benson said, Brother, pray again. <laughs> the prophetic word. We prophesied to a young man that was helping us in... in uh, it's the Pope, Oklahoma, playing the piano. I prophesied over everybody, about 23 people. It wasn't much in a little meeting on Sunday afternoon in 1975. Prophesied over the little babies and, and the children. Oh, the glory of God was there. And God said, there's one more, the pianist. I just had met the young man. I went over to him, laid hands upon him, and the Holy Ghost, the anointing of prophecy, the sprinkling of the precious blood was spoken and he was released in a new ministry that has gone around the world. And David Ingalls was set free to write music that afternoon. God said, I'm going to give you a new anointing. You shall write music. You shall set the captive free. You shall set families free. The prophecy went on and on. And every time he put out an album on the back, you'll see that prophecy. Holy Let's go now to Isaiah 52. 
I'll just have to quit. I'm not finished. <laughs> Isaiah 52. And many prophecies. Oh, to Sharon Doherty, Billy Joe Doherty's wife. Sharon says it was later on in 78. Has the prophecy come over her? Now she's another great songwriter. And she sings to the glory of God. By the prophetic word, she was before that a pastor's wife raising kids, which is good. But now the ministry through the prophetic word was released. Hallelujah. The anointing breaks the yoke. What are we doing? We're lifting gas off of the earth by the authority of the Lord. When we pray, when we pray, when we glorify God and set the captive free, death is lifting. Not just one receiving deliverance. The glory of God is in the earth. Isaiah 52. How does this, how does it release in the the glory of God's planning. Let's start with verse 13. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred. Here we go again. His visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. This was given 500, put it down by that verse, 500 years before it happened. So shall he, what? Here we go. Sprinkle. And the word there in the Hebrew is nazah. N-A-Z-A-H. Nazah. Means to sprint with great force. So shall he sprinkle many nations. And the king shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now let's wrap it all up. The glory of the anointing of the blood of sprinkling is connected to the ashes of the red heifer and the sprinkling of lifting death off of Israel. Now it's a statute forever. Now the word brings it over to the prophet Isaiah to you and I, and says the connection is they beat him in the face. And because they beat him in the face, you have the power and authority of the ashes of the red heifer to speak the prophetic word, prophesy to us, who is it that hits you? Now we've been given the right to prophesy, and the anointing of the prophetic anointing lifts death off the of people, and the power and the glory of God. He lost his life for our sake. So that we will lose our life for his and release the fruits and the gifts of the Holy Ghost and speak. And therefore, I'll keep preaching. Therefore, I'll keep prophesying in the 90s. And therefore, the anointing of deliverance shall still be in the household of God because it lifts death off of the earth. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for the truth that's in Jesus and the anointing. Let's just magnify him with the Holy Ghost language. Go ahead, stand up and let's praise him. We should shout the victory all over this place. The blood of sprinkling sets us free. For you have come unto the eternal spirit and the covenant thereof. And as I, the mediator of the covenant, We'll mediate it and we'll explain it and we'll anoint you. It is my blood that's within you that speaks forth in the earth. So therefore go forth and say, O earth, 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 hear ye the word of the Lord. For the earth will respond to your voice because my blood spoke and my anointing is in the earth. So do not fear the earth. Yea, will work and my authority shall be upon you because my peace is within my people. Be not fearful, but believe and walk in the anointing of the cool of the day. And learn of me, saith the Lord, for this is your finest hour. I'll raise up the army of the Lord. 
that's already among you, and my peace shall bring it to pass, for this is the anointing. And as you sprinkle the authority of my blood, death is lifted off of the earth, and the preparation of the Lord is at hand, and my people will be strong and do exploits. Release, stir up the gift, speak, and let the blood speak, for this is the day the Lord has made you for this day, and we'll rejoice together. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Koradasi kalabariyanda laboshanda. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, precious is the soul that makes me. White as snow, no other sounds I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.